Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 434 I'm gonna say hopefully it's 434 if it's not 434 then I do apologize no I don't really mistakes happen you can Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. <laughs> if it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you listen to the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review, download the show, share it to all your friends, and all that malarkey. And of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. That patreon.com for us, A G O S T I N H O. You know the deal. Click the links in the bio, click the links in the description, click the links at the bottom, add more details, do all that good stuff. All in between, you know how we crack it. Anyway, how are you? How are you all doing? Hope you're well, wherever you may be. Um, if it's on a beach somewhere in the middle of Dubai, could you manage to sneak out? If you're in a beach somewhere in the middle of Spain, could you manage to sneak out? Or if you happen to be in a fairly well-insulated um, two-bedroom apartment somewhere in the depths of East or South London or North or West, wherever you are in the world, hope you're doing well and you're hanging in there because God damn it, it's been a journey in it god damn it it's been a journey it's been a journey and a half and um oddly enough i think i noticed it the other i think i know when i noticed it no i noticed it yesterday actually the other day i was having a little browse on the interwebs as i do and i'm obviously you know i'm always uh checking the coronavirus subreddit uh the us one which is just standardly corona and obviously the uk one with the uk at the end and i've noticed in the last what month or so maybe it's actually you know started to become a little bit more frequent now in the last few weeks i have noticed a real big increase in posts of people saying that they're really struggling mentally right people are having a hard time having you know coming to grips with this new reality and um, coming to grips with this prolonged period of time spent indoors blah 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 but it seems like people are really feeling the pain right now and it's interesting because we're effectively towards the end we're at the home stretch now right we've vaccinated what 15 million people or something crazy in the uk we've basically done everybody from group one to four we have only left people above the ages of 50 which is you know most of the um, at-risk people um most of the people are going to be at risk of the virus itself so we're essentially at the home stretch we're getting all these really good leaks about bars opening about people going back to school all this stuff that should be giving people a sense of optimism and a sense of hope but instead it's actually filling people with more dread and it made me think i wonder if this is what happens with people in prison right because you do hear well you don't hear it but usually see it depicted a lot in in movies where somebody that's you know got a, a long sentence comes towards the end of it and they inevitably get themselves in some kind of trouble now that could be just you know um the a narrative skill that people do when they're writing these kind of movies to make them captivating or to make them compelling right have this sort of like arc of this person doing a good job and then you know towards the end they get corrupted by the system and then something goes bad but it does seem to be a thing right people trying to keep their heads down towards the end not being drawn into anything i wonder what that is i wonder if that's like um our version of not acting out but it's just i don't know what it is really but i wonder if there's any similarities in it with people in prison i wonder if that's the same thing like i wonder if like mentally this prolonged period of time because that's the thing as well as odd as well because prison is different because you get a release date right that's the thing that you get obviously it's a terrible situation to go through um, i would imagine i haven't been i haven't been to one even though i probably look like i should be in one um like a proper one anyway right everyone gets kind of pulled up on the odd um skirmish here and there when you're younger but in terms of actually spending prolonged period of time in a place like that i haven't um and i'd imagine you know it's not a best place to be especially if you end up there through no fault of your own right through just you know taking a couple wrong turns in life and you end up there i think sometimes if you probably you know had a life where you've kind of committed to a life of crime um you know since you're you know since you were a kid it's probably inevitable that you're either going to end up dead or in prison so it's not that much of a culture shock but i'd imagine if you're just a regular civilian who's just you know down on your luck and you try a little move you try to do a little deets a little scam here a little scam there and then all of a sudden you end up in prison it could be a real like you know it could be a real um uh blow to your kind of you know how you perceive reality but some of the comfort in it i'd imagine is the fact that you get a release date 
and if you behave yourself you then get let out early sometimes right um and but you have a date in the sand of when you can go and when you be uh, sorry when you be able to be let out back to you know civilization so you can integrate uh, back into society in some way shape or form and become a valuable member of your local community repair the relationships with your family blah 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 but we've had none of that we've had zero from the very onset we've had no real idea as to when this will end now again don't get me wrong a prison sentence and a you know and an airborne virus are two different things right it's mutating um different strains are popping up all over the place which they still haven't figured out where it actually originated from so there's loads of things on the table that are kind of throwing it out of the way but i think that lack of date has really affected people more than people actually realize yes the fumbling of the situation hasn't been the best they haven't dealt with it great that's all you know we can all kind of write an essay on how badly they've done things but i think if they would have had a plan where there were some dates in the sand some actually you know some timetables or some targets to hit not even numbers like targets in terms of like if we get to this or incentivized targets we get to this number that would mean we can open this thing at this date da, 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 x y and z if anything the only thing we've got any dates on were schools which makes sense right children education is important but in terms of the wider society that's what i think has really hurt people i think a lot more people could have hanged on especially the ones that have kind of self-expired they probably could have had a little more you know hope of i don't know again reading into this more than i probably should do but <clears throat> which is probably the benefit of having a podcast right you read into things that don't really matter but um you would hope that maybe people that would have people that did self-expire this year and last maybe would have held on a little longer if they knew you know hey by june by may that thing that you enjoyed the most you'd be able to do it again it just gives you that little glimmer of hope that you can hold on to whereas this is just you know so it's no coincidence i don't think that now that we have an actual date in terms of getting a roadmap in the 22nd and things are looking up on the up people have kind of had an adverse reaction to it maybe it's because they've been so used to being disappointed that now that that date's been announced everyone's like oh no this is a a bad sign i'm not too sure but there's definitely something in it um but either way i'm still quietly optimistic that um things will get back to some level of normality i think all these leaks coming out should give people a lot more hope than what they have have done in the, in the past it seems like um i feel like we're far too gone now especially with the vaccine for them to really mess it up it would really require a you know a cock up of um you know exponential levels in order to mess this up where we are now we're literally just about to cross the line we just need a little bit of a push in order to get there and once we're there things shall sooner rather than later get back to where they need to be that is the hope that is the hope um cool what else did i do on the weekend oh, oh yeah weekend the most important thing of course on the weekend watching manchester united play quite possibly one of the worst brands of football that you can see in the premier league um so but united drew 1-1 away from home against west brom which on paper i guess you could say isn't a bad result but considering how we started the season considering that we were you know top <coughs> for a couple of weeks and considering that we were kind of led to believe that we're in some sort of title challenge and that this side had the credentials needed or the players or the personality in order to mount that it's disappointing to see where we are how we're fluttering and how we just can't necessarily keep uh, pace with what Manchester City are doing I think they recorded what is it 16 um, wins back to back right conceded hardly any goals looking stronger than ever they rested Ruben Diaz the other day and still ended up you know winning so we just look you know in context the result isn't that bad but considering what else is going on in the league and considering the chance we have to actually mount a tight challenge especially with Liverpool um, you know off form it really is an opportunity missed and I guess as a game itself, it was pretty poor in terms of quality. I don't think we saw much from either side to suggest that they <laughs> that they are worth their ticket in admission. I think United might be the worst footballing side of the top six. I would say. I think if we're not playing counter-attacking football, we're pretty boring and turgid and passive and lackluster to watch the ball goes side to side we keep possession while the stats are all in our favor but in terms of incisive uh patterns in our play in order to open teams up we don't have answers and people can say oh it's hard to defend against teams hard to play against teams who play 11 men behind the ball but cool 
they know we have good players so they don't want to give us space this is a common thing that we're going to face with teams that are outside of the quote-unquote top six they're never going to play to our liking well, why should they right they're smaller sides with less resources and probably not as good tech players as we have they have to make the best of what they can if they can and the best thing for them in that possibility to get a point or to win the game would be to sit deep make sure they limit the spaces um you know make sure they don't allow us to go wide and put in little crosses make us play in the middle through the net well, narrowly as much as possible which is impossible because you have to break basically three lines of defenders and then hope that they can spring an attack on the counter or nick a goal whenever they get the chance which they most likely will because with our defense we're always going to leak a goal or two and our keepers don't seem to be in the best of form at the moment especially david de Gea. so again it wasn't as if like we dominated the game in that sense we might dominate position but i would gladly say west brom probably had the better chances they probably had the more clear-cut chances uh chances that they actually you know uh devised not from our mistakes but actual good play switching the ball out to the flanks crossing it in um they had uh digne or diengi or what's his name playing up front for um uh, west brom who caused um harry Maguire and Victor Lindelof, all sorts of problems. Diangana, um, Diangi, if you pronounce him, Diangi or Diangi, or however he pronounce his name, he ended up scoring two, a goal in the first minute or first two or three minutes. He basically out muscled um, Victor Lindelof in the box and just ended up heading it home and um that's maybe an example of just where we've kind of faltered at the moment right the defense isn't that good but again i think it's an easy excuse to blame our center backs we know our center backs aren't the best we know we don't have um we know that we signed harry Maguire to be the transformational center back in the likes of uh you know what's his name uh virgil van dyke but he's not that player we grossly overpaid for him he's probably no better than a james tarkovsky um you know ben me um, that sort of level of player, I would I would go as far as saying I don't even think he's better than Eric Dyer as a centre back. He's pretty average. He's slow. Um, for the size that he is, he gets manhandled too way too often, as you saw in the second half towards the end of the game, where he kind of tried to buy a foul in his own box by um, letting Diengi basically wrestle him to the floor it should have been a free kick don't get me wrong but still a defender should never be in a position where they're trying to win fouls in their own box you should just be clearing it all you know um whatever needs however way it needs be so all in all a pretty terrible game to watch now again analyzing it overall i think if we didn't have bruno fernandez on the pitch we probably wouldn't have drawn and if we didn't have our defenders in the that we have at the moment we probably wouldn't have conceded so this game was probably a fair result in terms of 1-1 i don't think either team were really that great up front i think even though west brom created better chances they didn't really have the quality to, to really convert them um apart from again digging his kind of goal um there wasn't you didn't really feel as if they were like threatening us but they did have better chances if you get what i mean it's hard to kind of compute it and then overall i just think our over-reliance on bruno fernandez is really telling like apart from it, i can't remember any other instances outside of that chance which he kind of you know shinned it in the top corner out of nowhere on his left foot you know a volley um it's kind of a goal that you don't really expect him to score he does he pulls up in clutch moments he's got crazy numbers but again he wasn't that great either he's really not one of the criticism i'd have of bruno fernandez even though he's kind of been a transformational player and i think he's raised our standards in the team and our expectation levels in the same way that maybe a ibrahimovic did when he came into a changing room the only issue i'd have with bruno fernandez is that he doesn't really play like a midfielder he plays way too far forward for me, which leaves too many gaps in the midfield and the defence. If you see here the lineup I got here on the screen, right? We play essentially like a four a four two three one, right? Kind of, right? Or you could say we play a four three three depending on how you look at it but either way what ends up happening because Bruno Fernandes is basically in line with Martial Cavani and Rashford or sometimes ahead of those guys it leaves a massive gap between um the the last striker and I guess the first midfielder that gap is really huge if he was playing as an actual attacking midfielder like a quintessential number 10 number 8 he would occupy this area a little bit more and they'd, they'd maybe move up as a unit and come back as a unit but at the moment what ends up happening is that when we're attacking we end up having all of these players further forward and then we have these two defensive midfielders and Fred and McTominay who I think personally aren't good enough to probably play that role we probably need a as kind of 
um, expert as a DM to play what one person in that role, so they have to go away and play two. But I still think both of them probably aren't good enough positionally to kind of be disciplined enough to kind of screen the back line. And then the back line itself, especially with the two centre backs, are not necessarily good enough to play further up the field because they're both pretty slow. They get turned very quickly. They're easily turned. They're easily dribbled past. And they get manhandled way too easily, especially Maguire given his size. I think Vuta Lindelof is, is always, you know, he's never going to be that kind of combative physical defender. He probably would be best suited to playing in a system with a back three. Um, he's a little bit more better. He's a he, he's a little bit more cultured, let's say, on the ball. Um, but still, they, they because we we don't have that confidence in the middle of the pitch. They kind of you know drop a bit too deep, which leaves too many gaps for a forward, which then gives the opposition the chance to exploit those holes and those gaps. And in general, you know, there's always a mistake and there's always a goal that we're going to see off the back of that. And of course. You could blame the players, but I think a lot of that has to do with the management. I still think, you know, even when we're at the top of the league, I just don't, you know, Man City obviously doing what they're doing now. I just don't think you can win the Premier League with a manager or the coaching staff of the calibre of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, Michael Carrick, Kieran McKenna, Darren Fletcher and co. It's just not going to happen, right? You're, you're competing against the best of the best. You see what Chelsea did with Thomas Tuchel and they just, you know, as I'm recording this, they just won two new at home against Newcastle. I think that's like four victories on the row now. Fair enough, he hasn't really faced that tough opposition, but he still had to win the games. He's winning the games. He's finding out who his best players are. They're playing a really great band of football. He's converted, you know, Callum hudson Adoy into a right wing back like he's you know brought back you know Marcus Alonso who look like he's, his career's finished at Chelsea um, Antonio Rudiger's been restored like he's just kind of you know top coaches do what top coaches do and I guess the players respond to that now it could be the new manager bounce some people believe it some people don't regardless of what you think I still think at the very very top if we want to be a title winning side winning Champions Leagues winning league trophies competing in um, you know domestic cups we have to have a manager that's best in class at the moment infrastructure wise as a team we're not best in class we don't have the infrastructure to support Ole Gunnar Solskjaer which, which you know I would hazard I would assume this is just my guess all these years he's been at the club so far which is what coming up to three years there's been no real indication I've heard from his side that he wanted a sporting director so I would assume he probably doesn't want one because I think if we had a director of football who could come in maybe work alongside Oli and the coaching staff to kind of spec out the plan of the club you know overall in a three or five four year five year period lay out exactly what we want to do present that to the supporters in terms of here's our long-term vision of what we want to be as a club so it could kind of you know calm us down a little bit somewhat but at the moment we have kind of just been told to believe and to hope that this gets better but we're then also being told that social needs more players in order to get this better and i just don't see the correlation between having great players and not having a great coach i just don't think you win league titles that way you might fluke a champions league roberto di matteo proved it um a few other managers i think even avb Aver, uh, no, Aaron grant maybe has done the same thing there's been a few managers who are basically able to win trophies but in order to kind of win league titles defend the titles you need to have top class managers you can't be having players that we have at the moment being coached by the coaching staff we have and be expecting different results. I just don't think it's going to happen. I think the, the great results were the great results because we have good players and they were able to perform. But the moment that stopped and we needed other solutions, we need maybe a change in formation, a change in tactics, a change in personnel, whatever it may be, just to kind of get us restarted again, our coaching staff have come wanting. And you have to really look at it and think to yourself, yes, of course, there's a rumour out there, I think at the moment now, especially the defenders that supposed to be Eric Bailly got into a car crash that's why he hasn't been involved which is strange because he keeps getting picked in the squad so I don't know what's going on there if you're in the squad or on the bench you'd imagine you're fit enough to play right so if he's not in the right mental state to play he shouldn't be anywhere near the club but um or anywhere near the sorry the match day squad if that's the case so it, 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 let's say that's not the case there's still something to be said for complaints to be had for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer thinking that Victor Lindelof is the better defender of out of Eric Bailly and him. That's some of the things that I kind of think kind of lets him lets him down and lets down the coaching staff. That kind of decision making, where you just think to yourself, like, how does that make any sense? The fact that you know Maguire plays every single game, even when he's not playing well, and doesn't get rotated with somebody else, give him a bit of a break. The fact that we rely on Bruno Fernandes so much. The fact that Rashford is, seems to be 
putting up all the numbers, but his actual performances in games are just, you know, not what you'd expect them to be. The fact that Marshall can't hit a barn door to save his life, the fact that we bought an, you know, an old an aging Edison Cavani who looks like he's out of his depth. Um, in all sense purposes and he's meant to be a striker that we're meant to rely on more so than Odin Ugalo who I thought didn't was, didn't really get a fair crack of the whip at United when it came down to it as soon as you know Cavani walked in we treated him as a brand new toy and kind of dismissed of 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 Ugalo and I would hazard a guess that you know they're probably not that far apart in terms of what they can offer teams right now yes Cavani's maybe had a better career than Odin Ugalo but you can't tell me that Ugalo wouldn't offer more than Cavani's offering now at the moment it's just a complete mismanagement of the squad. And again, I'm really worried about us finishing in top four. Maybe we've recruited enough points that it's going to be very hard for us to drop out. But considering how much fire has been rejuvenated into Chelsea, considering the fact that Mourinho essentially his job's on the line if he doesn't get top four, finish at least fifth, considering Arsenal have kind of caught a bit of a second wind, um, Leicester are obviously doing bits and I really rate Brendan Rodgers I think he's another very underrated manager in the league it's not um, it's not a foregone conclusion that we could finish maybe outside of the top two maybe even finish third do you know what I mean considering how we started the season that is an abject failure especially if we don't win a trophy and it, it's just it just doesn't fill me with hope like knowing that we're going to have to rely on just Ole Gunnar Solskjaer what, getting better as a coach overall in the next year or so with better players I just don't see how that happens but again you know what can you do United won West Brom won away from home I guess it's a point better than nothing and I guess we go again we go again very very soon what else happened on the when to talk about oh yes I also happened to watch UFC 258 um, main event featuring Kamaru Usman versus Gilbert Burns. Um, a very, very, very entertaining fight. Um, I think I mentioned it prior. I think I was reading a couple articles on it. And it's just the thing I love about MMA, right? The thing I personally love about UFC is the fact that, you know, of course, Dana White has all these faults. You know, the fact that the fighters don't get compensated as much as they should do. The fact that he kind of rules it in a kind of cowboyish way is really not beneficial to the fighters. He has his favorites and all that sort of stuff. It can get a little bit dark when you really look into the stuff that goes on behind the scenes at the UFC. But the one thing you can't deny is that the matchmakers do a really good job at making sure whoever's the best face the best in each division there is no gimmies there is no easy run to titles and champions sorry um to uh belts there is no easy way to challenging for those belts there's no easy way to break into the top 10 the top five you really have to earn your right to be in the octagon with some of the best fighters in your division you have to earn it no way no doubt and the moment you earn it is the moment you get an opportunity and when you get the opportunity you have to take it with two hands and and what you like to see is that you get to see somebody like Gilbert Burns smash through who he smashed through on his way to the title um, contention. And then you get to see Kamaru Usman, you know, defend his belt against who he defended his belt against. And then you get to see both of them fight in Octagon with that knowledge that you know that they're both elite level, right? It's, which is very, very different to what you'd expect from boxing. Because boxing, obviously you know they've got the issue with the promoters and stuff it makes it hard to kind of put matches together and a lot of people have their records padded because it's really the importance on having a kind of um, undefeated record in boxing is probably overstated more so than it is in UFC um so you you're never really sure if the person you're you're kind of watching is actually facing the best in class you're not really sure you're just obviously watching the person because you want to watch them but you know you only have to look at Deontay Wilder and see how his career has kind of come crumbling down the moment he had to face somebody um halfway decent um but in UFC they're constantly getting t tested and I think Kamaru Usman got tested in the biggest way possible. That first round from Gilbert Burns was sensational. Clipped him with the right hand, I think around minute something, 120 or something, right on the temple. Um, Kamaru Usman's legs started going up from him, behind him, underneath him. So he composed himself, somehow managed to, you know, um, get his bearings back and going and then survived that onslaught and then started the second round really strong and essentially ended up finishing it with a TKO um, towards the middle of the second round, I'm going to say second round or third, just sensational to watch. And again, this is somebody who is specifically known as a wrestler, specifically known as a grappler. 
to be known as somebody having kind of elite ground game is now come back through the you know assistance of coach Whitman with it's like Chris boxing like that jab that he was throwing at Gilbert Burns was there was some meat in that jab made some real 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 power it was literally knocking his head back so much so that that one jab I think when he switched stance actually ended up you know flooring him which led to um, um, Kamaru Usman going for the ground and pound and essentially finishing it with TKOs it was just with um, with punches on the floor like absolutely sensational performance and and again a proper championship performance I think you don't become champion without having your bell rung a couple of times and I think the fact that his leg wobbled underneath him and kind of maybe pitch someone like myself being a bit of an amateur and a bit of a casual watching it from afar you'd think oh shit he's definitely gonna lose now but championship level fighters don't do that right they find a way to kind of compose themselves gather their thoughts get their legs back underneath their shoulders and just center themselves somehow and I think he mentioned it even in a fight in a post-match reaction he mentioned how oh, that kind of woke him up that kind of let him know oh you're into a fight here Gilbert's no joke he's coming to take your belt he wants what you have and um yeah just Kamara Usman ended up just you know uh getting himself back together again and just kind of snuffing what what I saw it as right it's him just snuffing Gilbert Gilbert burns a scandal like just he just snuffed it out in a in a couple of rounds it was sensational to watch man what a great performance um and again, it goes to show just how great these guys are at this level. Because Gilbert Burns' face, again, the only heartbreaking bit about it is Gilbert Burns at the end crying. Um, and, you know, a lot of it probably had to do with him maybe realizing that, oh, this guy I used to train with, this guy that we kind of came up with together, he's just another level from what I remember him from being before. And that must be such a um frustrating thing to kind of reconcile as a fighter right you've done everything right you've eaten right you slept right you've trained you've done everything you can to make sure that you are at the peak physical and mental conditioning to step into the octagon and make you know and challenge for the title and then the person that used to face in you know in training who you think you might have his number and you think you might you know have a chance of beating him you don't think you know you know it deep down yeah I've got, I've got, i can beat this guy i know he can I, i've seen his best in the gym but then he turns up to the octagon under the bright lights and he's a different beast he's turned into number one a fierce competitor and also a much better fighter than you remember him to be and it's just like can you close that gap that's a question like I've could be proved most people couldn't close the gap right he just kept getting better and better and people just couldn't close that gap until he just ended up retiring because there was not much competition left for him to face and I guess that's probably part of the reason why Gilbert Burns was just overcome with emotion just thinking what can I do how am I gonna ever ever you know uh get this guy when he's this good right like he's improved this much from the time that i knew him like how am i ever going to get back at that level again it must be such a hard thing to kind of um you know come to grips with in your head if you're a fighter like damn man this guy's really performed better than i never imagined he would do but again my excellent excellent performance um big up kamara usman survives the early scare finishes gilbert burns with a biogen punch in the ufc 258 main event absolutely amazing fight to watch from the outside i have to admit definitely amazing fight to watch what else we got here 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 oh yeah a bit of good news so this is courtesy of this guy on twitter called um john burn murdoch who must be someone involved in the science let's see what does he do he is a story stats and scatterpots for financial times so he provided a little graph here said when lockdown is getting me down i look to i look at the israel hospital data and this is a screenshot he provided here and it says the average age of people seriously ill with covid in israel's hospitals is falling dramatically as vaccines take effect and as you can see it's a you know a standard graph plotted on the screen but towards the right hand side is a real market drop off and that means and obviously there's some green lines here which kind of indicate the first vaccine doses and the second and as soon as the seconds gets administered the amount of hospitalizations i'm assuming here where people are seriously ill falls really really drastically so it goes to prove that the vaccine does go a long way in preventing people from getting ill and obviously you know uh, fatally passing away um and it also is a great indication as to you know life returning back to some semblance of normality that this is happening when vaccines get rolled out so again if you're on the fence and you're still feeling down and stuff whatever it may be definitely keep this graph in mind because as more vaccines come out 
as we get more data definitely things will end up getting back to normal very very soon let's move on from that one let's pause du, 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 du. what else we got here oh yeah this is cut oh yeah so this is the most interesting news of the day i think right so let's go here let's push this and make sure that because there's our loaded that screen is going to be giving me mad nonsense isn't it okay cool so let's get this back up here so this is courtesy again another one from Twitter. this is courtesy of robert peston who's kind of been at the forefront um in terms of providing us with leaks from the government concerning covid it's been a little bit annoying don't get me wrong that you guess especially in the big i think he got a lot more negative reaction um earlier on when things were a bit bleak and he tended to be the first person to kind of deliver the you know the bad news and if you're a journalist now at the moment you're not really that well regarded by the public in general right in the uk in europe in parts of the us people just hate journalists for the most part because you know they think they're the enemy of the people because they're not necessarily doing the work that you'd think a journalist would do instead they kind of you know nitpicking people's language and flipping chat rooms and trying to you know tell people what how they should and shouldn't think instead of actually going to the access of power and challenging them at every turn they're essentially just basically keeping up the status quo but obviously towards the end of the you know the time now that we've kind of been locked down and we're going to hopefully be heading out of it and back to our normal lives robert Peston's kind of been great in terms of updating us in terms of some of the things that's going on um that we can maybe anticipate for this new announcement coming forward it might indicate where we're basically going and i guess the good news was for myself and people that are interested in stuff that i'm interested in is that this original tweet here this is from about you know sometime earlier today he noted during Boris Johnson's press conference he said important um Boris Johnson says that the way theatres nightclubs and concerts and so on will be able to open will be by them insisting those who attend can prove they've been vaccinated or have a rapid flow test um which is surely a COVID identity card he said here by the back door if it allows us to important feedback uh, freedom back is this infringement on one civil availability such a bad thing so i think there was a lot of talk if you remember in early i guess in the summer there was some conversation around um COVID passports um in order to attend you know large-scale events and the idea i thought behind it mostly had to do with insurance companies not wanting to be liable for anyone ended up sick the last thing you know the organizers of, of coachella or glastonbury want is for somebody to contract COVID at their premises end up passing away or passing it to somebody and some something fatal happening no one wants to have that on their back on their conscience um end up in the court case it's just not good pr at all so if you can kind of mitigate that um responsibility by having your patrons either you know uh pay for a rapid test on site or have some sort of card that basically tells the, the the organizer that you have been cleared of having covid in the last let's say two weeks a month whatever it may be <coughs> or you've so you've been vaccinated in the last two months weeks whatever how long the window is it then kind of absolves them of responsibility if anything goes wrong because you know you have essentially um declared that you're healthy enough to attend is to do it to everybody else and by theory even if you know there is some um wiggle room there because people do bring back tests where they they'll be double negative when they're not so that can basically happen you know some anomalies can occur but it does mean that we can maybe get back to some semblance of normality if you remember there was that event earlier on in the summer where i think the primavera organizers did like a kind of trial run where they essentially tested everybody before the actual event and if you were positive unfortunately you couldn't attend but then if you weren't then you could go in and it was essentially a standard primavera festival done on a smaller scale i think that 1600 people attended local acts playing only so limited again people traveling back and forth bloody blah 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 um but they were able to do that in the midst of everything that's going on have people dancing and reveling around each other no restrictions no nothing and if we are thinking that entire sectors on their knees which you know the hospitality and nightlife industry definitely is suffering a lot there's not been a lot of support not really been an indication as to when it can reopen so i guess the, on one hand i think sasha lord mentioned it earlier the fact that Boris johnson has even uttered the word nightclub in a, you know i think the first time maybe in 11 months is something to kind of be happy about because it does mean that you know it might be in these plans and the announcements coming forward next week but it's also maybe a sobering um realization that if you do want to go back to nightclubs there might be as 
Preston um, kind of noted, there might have to be some sort of give and take. Um, there might be some sort of sacrifices needed in terms of you getting inside a nightclub again. So the question would be, do you want to go back in a nightclub bad enough that you're willing to infringe on your own civil liberties, um, be put on some sort of list, a database, have your, you know, information, DNA, whatever it may be called, uploaded on some sort of system that allows you to enter a nightclub again? Is it worth that? That's the question. Is it worth that? And I don't know for myself whether or not it is to go back. I would much rather maybe wait. We've already waited as long as we have now at the moment. If it means waiting a few more months in order to get everybody vaccinated, so that means that everything can reopen as was before. Fair play. But what's the timeline of that? Really and truly, the, the only place, only time I can see you know, a nightclub that I went to in 2019 opening to the same scale, as I mentioned in other videos, is 2022. In terms of actually everyone just, you know, elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, spitting on each other, hanging out in a smoking room, getting busy in the, in the toilets. I can't see that happening any other time ahead of that. Um, so this is maybe a kind of uh, realisation, a wake up call for everybody. If you want to go back to clubs, you're going to have to um, give up some of your civil liberties. Harsh, but that might be the truth. So it continues here. This is an update. He says the following. Um, Downing Street is very keen to point out that the PM has explicitly ruled out that there will be an official requirement to carry a vaccine passport or proof of having the COVID test before going to a pub and so on, which you can see here. But he says, my point is that when he says he, we can reopen, we can only reopen theatres and so on with mass vaccinations and the use of rapid lateral flow testing that introduces an unofficial system of COVID-19 identity cards, whether that's by government ordinance or not. The only way the PN can prevent COVID-19 identity cards being intruded by the back door is to make it illegal for a theatre or entertainment pub to refuse entry to someone who can't prove that they've had a vaccine or not. Would that be rational for him to do so? Is it likely no one knows so that's very important to point out there so it looks like the government is trying to absolve themselves of responsibility they don't want to be um you know they've already done a bad job as it is they don't want to be known as the people putting forward these draconian almost orwellian um you know requirements for people to go and you know shake their bums in a club somewhere they won't they don't want to be known as that so they kind of absorbing themselves of blame and placing it mostly on the operators in that sector so Will these clubs, in order to reopen, decide to do such a thing? How would that email be worded? <laughs> How many people would want to do so, considering the kind of um, anti, uh, anti kind of anti everything you'd, you'd imagine personnel that kind of occupies or goes into a nightclub in the first place you'd imagine it wouldn't really go down well but i don't know man spending 11 months indoors does funny things to your to your resolve right it might make you be more willing to do things that you probably weren't willing to do so in the past but let me know in the comments do I, would you be willing to um carry around a vaccine passport in order to make sure you can go into your favorite nightclub or would you like me rather wait until we can go back with uh, having to upload our data and spit and DNA onto a, you know, a main database somewhere in order to open a nightclub. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Okay, what else we have here? Let's move on from that. We have this. Da, 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 da. Let's move on from that. What else we have here? Ba, 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 ba. What else we have here? We have death, bear with me. Okay, UK, counter death. Yeah, so this is, the, I guess, another good update. Again, there's all these good indications. So I mean, that you have to just, it's, I know it's difficult and stuff, but you just have to hold on. You really do have to hold on if you can, as best as you can, because things are definitely looking like they're going to get better. This is a headline here from The Guardian. It says, UK travel com campaign ramps up pressure to allow holidays abroad from the 1st of May. Save our summer group calls for government roadmap to open up travel and reassurances the UK makers is to make it safe to book for the summer. So it seems that the government's getting pressured from all sides of industries, right? Every part of the economy is suffering. And I guess the support in terms of furlough and all these other bits and bobs are probably going to run out in the next few months anyway. So for the government, they probably don't want to be expending any more money than they need to. And these industries just want to get back up and started again. Do you know what I mean? No one wants to miss out on another summer. Um, it was bad enough missing out on summer and Christmas. No one wants to miss out on two seasons if you can get hold of them. So it continues here. It says the following. The travel sector is stepping up 
um look at that imagine just being on a crystal in a you know in a sandy beach like that with a crystal blue sea just imagine oof, it looks like such a there's a funny thing right? <clears throat> when you go about some of these things this looks like such a privilege but anyone can do so right most the most people yeah, live in western europe <clears throat> with some sort of disposable income can afford a summer holiday here and there right maybe every other year every two every five but you can go if you want to go in your lifetime it's not that out far out of reach but the fact that we haven't been able to move freely when you see these pictures it kind of looks like something that's in the middle of monaco or saint Tropez and stuff i don't know where they actually it's just in mallorca it looks like yeah, a picture of mallorca which is fairly cheap to fly to um low-cost airlines from you know from the uk go there quite often and there's a big you know british population out there two expats and whatever it may be but you look at that and you think to yourself that looks like you know something only reserved for the rich and it's funny though isn't it though because during lockdown the only people who have been able to travel freely quote unquote have been people of means who've been letting us know that they've been able to do it that's the odd thing right they're providing us with the content um it's giving us fomo um it's giving us wanderlust uh but they're also the only ones that are permitted to do so because you know they can wrangle the rules they can order themselves a test kit get vaccinated ahead of time behind the table there was that concierge service i think in dubai that was offering a package trip for people of high means something like 20 grand each or something you get flown um out to somewhere in the uae or somewhere else in the middle east um you get put in a hotel you get a vaccine the hotel's like a you know it looks like a beach resort somewhere uh you know nice jacuzzis and pools everywhere like just beautiful experience like a whole the whole shebang you stay there for 11 days and then you get flown back out flown back home again <clears throat> so they're, they're basically enjoying a whole different reality than we are but again hold on because this is good news for us because if it means the travel sector is kind of pushing for this it also means it's going to serve us better when things reopen up it says here the travel sector is stepping up its um ignore the government quote-unquote messaging with the launch of a campaign to reassure consumers that it's safe to book holidays in this summer the save our summer sos group is calling on the government to ensure holidays at home and abroad are possible from may 1st and guarantees that anyone who books through its members will be entitled to either a refund or a change of date for their holiday if the travel is cancelled or not possible due to the government's covid restrictions the campaign has support from more than 120 camp companies including easyjet holidays uh, travel finders dialify and uh, that are ununited in the outrage of the government's handling of the crisis and failure to support tourism. The quote says, UK citizens should ignore government ministers <laughs> conflicting the advice of the book Summer Trips with Confidence, said the co-founder Paul Charles of the Peace Agency. So again, these sectors just had, and I'm surprised it's taken this long personally for people to just, you know, just do their own thing and be like, look, just book through us we're going to guarantee what we can and in, in for the most part and uh, i'd imagine a lot of um customers are probably willing to accept that risk because it gives them something to look forward to as well do you know what i mean so it continues here co-founder henry morley of true travel said the travel industry stands on the edge of the precipice today there must now be a clear roadmap set out for the first of may onwards specifically for travel in order to reinstate consumer confidence and protect millions of jobs which hang in the balance the group is also um, calling on quarantine measures to be replaced by an extensive testing program with rapid testing on the arrival of departure which is something you should have been implemented ages ago but hey uh, Boris Johnson the Prime Minister is due to give details on the easing of lockdown an announcement on 22nd of February and is under pressure from the tourism industry and lockdown skeptics to commit to a timetable to allow the gut domestic uh, trips in time for Easter leaders of the COVID recovery group are calling for pubs restaurants and other hospitality venues to be allowed to reopen in a way um, that the COVID is secure but also allows them to operate in a communally viable manner so far well, they've kind of won a little bit because i think they've taken off this dumb idea about having one substantial meal do you remember that whole nonsense last summer where the only way they could open bars and restaurants was by bars and sorry and pubs was if they uh, allowed or were able to offer their punters a meal which obviously limited people that could go in it's just a whole stupid thing that they had but you know for the most part pubs and restaurants for the industry have been you know coming one of the lowest in terms of the spread of covid i think the chart basically showed it was one of the bottom two places where the virus spread they're mostly kept up they're mostly kept very clean especially during this entire time screens everywhere people standing mask required and you're not drinking bloody blah 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 they do exactly what they can in order to make those things done but the funny thing is 
these lockdown skeptics who a lot of people were kind of moaning at earlier on in the lockdown process are uh, be are kind of oddly enough the people that we are sort of silently rallying behind right because they're pushing for the world to reopen or especially Inga to reopen much sooner than it probably should do but that's also putting pressure on other sectors to also do the same and push for it which also puts pressure on the government so you know there might be a, you know there might be some nut jobs included in that group of people but all in all I think ultimately they've been proven right especially when you consider the amount of damage um, this whole lockdown has done to everybody's psyche you know I mean in the long term it continues here chair of Cumbria um, tourism Jim Wall has said we are very optimistic about easter it's a very important time for us in a new season that will set the store for us in the year ahead the pandemic cost cumbria two billion in lost tourism god almighty in 2020 in a normal year in tourism it contributes to three billion of the country's economy he said he hoped that the count the sorry the county's economy three billion is generated from tourism that's mad he said he hoped the hotels and guest house would open soon after self-catering accommodation if not at the same time he added at the time when and there have been no income for hospitality business have spent funds on making sure they're COVID safe overall domestic tourism fell to 30 billion in 2020 down from 91 billion god on my is a big drop off so yeah again all these sectors putting pressure on the government means for us punters us average everyday civilians the end is near the end is near you'll be able to book your holidays very very soon so hang in there if you can hang in there if you can next on the list we have a very funny story courtesy of mix mac <laughs> funny and also pretty sad indication of where we are as a society at the moment so this is courtesy of mix mag so the following berlin police called to a 200 person rave that was just a facebook stream <laughs> oh it's such a tragic story so the following so police in berlin were called to the city's um magdalena club magdalena at the weekend after a concerned resident got in contact with a, a report of a suspected illegal party the woman called the emergency number 110 at around 9 30 p.m on saturday to inform the police that she was watching a dance music stream live on facebook major most important thing and apparently more than 200 people were in attendance uh reports of berlin zointag Zoin, zuntag or zointag how do you pronounce that word in response a police gathered a large number of officers headed to the night spot in friedrichstraße in friedrichstraße Friedrich Streis, Friedrich Streisen, Friedrich Strain, however you pronounce that, um, where they heard the muffled sound of loud. I should actually know to pronounce those words more often, considering how much I, you know, wank off bloody burger on here, innit? But hey, what can you do? Um, <laughs> where they heard a muffled sound of loud bass uh, fueled music coming from the inside, promptly surrounded the building. Although they noticed that looking through the windows didn't much, re didn't reveal much. Eventually, after ringing the door, someone came to open it and invited the officers inside to view the quote unquote party which was an internet live stream with no guests present beyond the people paying playing and running the stream the only audience were online viewers on facebook with the viewer symbol on the top left hand corner indicating 200 people were tuned in so this lovely or i'm, I'm guess again i'm gonna say old lady but if it's somebody in under 20s you can go and jump off a bridge but this old lady i'm assuming was kind of on facebook you know doing what old ladies do reading up on QAnon theories and all that sort of nonsense, stumbled upon this stream and then saw the little eye with the 269 next to it and thought, oh my God, that's people that, which is an int which is funny that she was able to interpret it as a sign that there was people in there, right? It's an intentional sign of like people, viewers. And she decided to call the police uh, because she was, you know, afraid that there was a legal party happening in the area. Now, obviously it's hilarious, but it's also kind of indicative of this kind of telltale society we're living in at the moment where people are fobbing in and calling in neighbors because of breaches of covid and you would have thought especially now considering how far along we are in this process of kind of you know living through this ordeal that people would have a lot more maybe i would say sympathy but understanding as to why some people would want to break the rules i haven't really broken them in any way meaningful way apart from you know going to see my parents here and there or hanging out with some friends whatever it may be but i haven't really you know done anything crazy but even i understand that even though I don't want to do it, I get other people would want to. I get other people aren't probably as strong or resilient as you and I and are able to kind of adhere and kind of put their life on pause in that way, shape or form. Some people are really finding it hard to kind of come to grips with the reality we're living in, right? That's probably explains a lot of these warehouse parties and, you know, birthday celebrations. I'm looking at you, Rita Aura, right? It probably explains it because people just can't come to grips. They can't 
accept that we're in this reality for maybe you know a few more months still and until then whatever they deem to be normal whatever they deem to bring them joy is going to be unattainable um but you know some people just don't want to accept that and i think that's okay i think they you know if you live by the sword you die by the sword if you accept that and you go ahead and do it and something bad happens then you just can't come around crying and complaining that you kind of you know infected your entire family and now you have no grandparents you can't come crying after that you take the risk it is what it is um but i'm just not keen or cool on the idea of people snitching on people having parties just don't go do you know what I mean you don't need to call in the feds they're gonna find out about it anyway because they're police officers they should be on their job and if they don't they don't but this idea that you would call in the feds because you saw a facebook stream is indicative of this culture we live in again i've i think i've kind of it's kind of made me view stuff like that business techno group a little bit differently especially now again considering how far down the line we are right um i don't know man it just comes across a little bit snitchy a little bit you know and i don't ever want to be that dude right i mean that's pointing fingers and telling oh they're over there doing a the bad thing i just won't go over there i'll tell my friends not to go over there i'll tell people i love not to go over there and just go somewhere else do you know what i mean it just feels a bit weird and the honest the honest truth of it is that these people this facebook stream i'm assuming they're just trying to keep themselves sane they're probably trying to raise some funds for the club the people that are playing these play graves are just trying to keep food on the table they've probably leveraged themselves in a way that would require them to be on the road all the time which is you know maybe not a good use of their finances but they're free to do what they want with their money um or they're just free to do what they want with their time and if people are willing to book them in these developing countries and third world countries and they're willing to put and they're willing with a clear conscience to go there and play and put people's life at risk then i guess it is what it is like i just don't see the benefit of kind of clipping them up and putting them on pages and kind of shaming them because there is no shame if you're willing to do it if you're willing to do it and you're willing to play and you're willing to post on your social uh, i just don't see the shame associated with trying to keep your head above water um during a time where most governments have failed with, with the exception of what vietnam new zealand australia south korea there's not really a lot of countries that have come out of this looking great right the isle of Wight, like parcels maybe scandinavia maybe right no no one's really and i would imagine you know in most of those countries the creative arts and the creative industries and the nightlife economy is probably bottom of the totem pole in terms of priorities so these people who are operators in there who kind of you know your, your whole life is again i mentioned in another podcast about how badly i feel about people that are working in you know bars and nightclubs actually in the actual places the people that work in a cloakroom and bar backs and stuff that's your entire life and it's just been taken away from you so uh, n- so imagine the fucking you know dopamine hit that djs and stuff need on the weekly daily basis it's no surprise that they're willing to put their life and their health at risk to go and play a play grave it doesn't make you know i mean especially almost willing to pay you for it during a time when you don't have that much money um so yeah i don't know man i think i'm a little bit i've gone off the whole idea of like you know retweeting these pages and sharing stuff and you know pretending because i'm not really outraged when i share these stuff on my socials i'm not i have to be honest i'm not really outraged it's just there's a little bit of kind of envy because you want to be there yourself right there might be a little bit of envy because you want to play there yourself there might be just a bit of envy because it's a reality that's really foreign from your reality at the moment but in terms of outrage and feeling angry it's happening not really I've never felt that. Even when I was posting the stuff about the possession parties in Paris earlier, what, last year sometime, wasn't filled with anger. If anything, I was thinking, God damn, I wish I could sneak away and go there. But I was too much of a pussy to go. So it is what it is. Um, but yeah, man, that's just a funny story. You know what I mean? She sees 200 people attending a Facebook event and she thinks there's actual people in the actual event, calls the police, they walk in, see a live stream, and they promptly head off on their way. Hilarious. Hilarious. What else we have here da, 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 da. let's move on got some more to get through um yeah so this is courtesy of the verge so um elon musk was on clubhouse maybe a few weeks ago um he did this really cool show on there called i'm gonna say it's called good time what's it called here da, 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 da. clubhouse what's it called <laughs> Yes, yeah, the Good Time Show. Yep. So he was on the show called The Good Time Show on Clubhouse, um, which is hosted by a husband and wife team, Siriam Krishnan and Arati Raga Rama 
Ramamurti, Ramamurti. Um, and it was a really, 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 and I guess one of the persons, one's a, one of them, I think the husband, is now being newly um, announced as a partner in the um, Mark Andreessen's kind of group thing, A16Z, right? So, the reason why I bring it up, it was a fantastic interview, maybe one of the best interviews I've heard from Elon in a while, and it kind of is funny because this comes off the back of I guess there's been some backlash when it comes to Clubhouse with some journalists, especially New York Times ones, who've basically made it their mission to counsel and bring down some of the more, you know, um, lap, some of the more prominent voices within tech, um, within startup industry, because they feel like they're toxic and they're bros and they're not in doing enough inclusion and all this sort of stuff. I don't know, whatever it is, they're just anti-capitalism. I don't know, who cares? But regardless of the nature, it has kind of breeded a pla it has kind of breeded an environment in terms of media where there does seem to be a bit of an adversarial relationship between some of these really amazing inspirational figures that lead these companies. Um and some of the interviews I've been having, which kind of leads to a shitty interview for people like myself to watch and listen to or read. Um, I think the the journalist Nelly Bowles, that's kind of um, going out with uh, Barry Weiss for the New York Times, a lady who I think is most kind of partly responsible for Jordan Peterson's uh, you know uh, breakdown because she was the person that kind of led that whole enforcement monogamy thing in 2018 i remember she read the article for new york times and basically um you know basically a hit piece on jordan peterson even though she acted like he was her friend and she was writing a good fluff piece on him went on tour alongside with dave dave rubin and jordan peterson ended up kind of stabbing them both in the back um and i remember she said something on twitter which she ended up deleting about oh um this elon musk interview on clubhouse was a real softy softy thing um just Journalists need to be in a room so they can press the in the in the, the person that's getting interviewed a bit more and get some really hard hitting questions instead of kind of lapping them up and just you know being their cheerleader. And I thought, no, actually, this is why people kind of are more prone and are more kind of drawn to podcasts because in the most part, a long form podcast is very difficult to have like an adversarial kind of you know um, I'm trying to take you down interview when you're sitting down with somebody for an hour or so. Um, you know you might kind of come into it with with one idea and then you come out of it with another because you've got time to actually sit down and speak to the person um, hear them actually flesh out their ideas uh, speak about their experiences where they're coming from how they think and it kind of gives you a bit of an, an idea and again most podcasts I listen to the best way to actually make your own mind up on a person is to actually just let them speak you see that happening with Candace Owens or she appeared on Joe Rogan right a lot of people kind of were able to kind of suss out that she's a bit of a dumb dumb because Joe Rogan just basically let her speak and kind of twist us off and so Circled. you saw the same thing happen with dave rubin so this idea that you have to kind of be um have a competitive relationship or interview in order to get the best um out of it is really dumb i've never really understood that i kind of i've really i've always hated it which is why i've never been a really big fan of the Kara swishes of this world right who kind of sits there in her aviator glasses and has this weird persona that she's the brittly um journalist that's going to push back and give these guys a hard time it's like we don't care we're here to find out about what new products they have maybe kind of answer some questions that we had burning in our heads and just hear them speak because you, you rarely kind of hear them speak in that fashion but i thought this interview was really good um the version of a really cool roundup regarding all the things that happened i'll quickly read out here um it says the media venture capital was our buzz this weekend for the advance of during and after the appearances of um musk in a not so quite one-year-old audio social network musk is not the uh recluse he gives interviews to more or less regularly but his arrival on clubhouse served as a validation for the company and the idea of live interactive audio streaming generally now i already said before i'm not really a fan of clubhouse i'm not i haven't really spoken in one room i've listened into a couple of things here and there i don't like the idea that i have to kind of tune into it like i'm tuning into radio even though again i was a big fan of radio back in the day the idea that i have to kind of you know set my clock and find out what time it is in america to be in these rooms is just annoying um it's the reason why i kind of switched over to podcasting for the most part because you can listen to it on demand whenever you want but hey ho you continue um da, 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 da. despite being at 1 a.m eat must room quickly hit the clubhouse cap of 5,000 concurrent listeners as did one overflow listening um hosting a broadcast of the appearance and then another overflow from a room after all day long hustlers and hackers sought to get into the action hosting pre-show discussion post-show recaps and in one at least a cash giveaway sponsored by square um on clubhouse musk appeared on the good time show um a roughly three week old 
late night event hosted by the husband and wife team i mentioned before guests and co-hosts on the show often include partners of andreessen horowitz clubhouse lead investor and most prominent public cheerleaders i've known of krishnan and, and Ruth since 2020 2012 sorry when i was interrupted um their coffee day at the cream in san francisco has continued blah, blah blah the tone of the show is lightweight by design successful tech people getting together after they put their kids to bed to discuss the news of the day without ever being too critical of anyone involved it's just a, in, uh, um, in this aspect the show is totally consistent um, with the mission of Andreessen and Horowitz laid out last week and his blog post announcing that he would create his own media company aspiring to be the go-to place for understanding and building the future for anyone who's building making curious about tech and that's I think is the most kind of wholesome and great bit I love about the show and I love about that interview in general um, again it kind of just as a reminder of kind of what I enjoy those interviews when you've got these sort of individuals who are kind of you know great but also maybe a bit flawed sometimes the flaws in them are basically you know reported already by most parts of mainstream media you need to provide them I feel like with an opportunity or a space that they can go to <clears throat> where they feel comfortable enough to speak about the good because the bad is always going to get highlighted by whoever wants to highlight them and it's interesting that the more that we've kind of seen Clubhouse be prominent, the more we've seen the more controversial people you would imagine in society kind of flock to it because they've seen it as a safe place for them to kind of be able to speak freely, which is kind of, you know, um, contradiction when you imagine what Taylor Lorenzo was trying to do a couple of weeks ago. But essentially, it's kind of proved um, the fact that a lot of these big figures in tech or people in general have kind of grown to distrust mainstream media and they're slowly but surely pulling themselves away which is why you're seeing a lot more of these big people talking on places like twitter you know putting up instagram lives you know going on podcasts whatever it may be they want to go directly and speak directly to their people to their audience or to people you know who are fans of them instead of you know using the media the mainstream media as a platform to speak because you know your words are going to get twisted which of course then leads me onto this amazing announcement courtesy of fortune magazine Yes, up here <clears throat> this is courtesy of fortune magazine it says here the, 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 and pause this in a video it's not video just pause this anyway so this is from fortune magazine it says the following tech crypto founder Andreessen Horowitz wants to replace the media is that bad news so it just says the following it says if you've ever been past and familiar to Silicon Valley or cryptocurrency you've likely heard of Andreessen Horowitz one of tech's highest profile venture capital firms the firm which uh, tech insiders call A16Z A116Z or A116Z however you pronounce it is famous in part because of its investments Facebook clone base and other names but also because of its mastery at charming and manipulating the media so perhaps it's no surprise that A16Z is building an empire a media empire sorry the details are still trickling out but the short version is that after a decade of cultivating journalists over intimate cocktail affairs the firm has decided to no longer need them instead a16z is hiring a large editorial team to cover stories um, about crypto fintech and other topics with an update slant if you want a long story read the exact uh, certain piece a16 press whisperer margaret that they wrote one reason that a16 will become a media outlet is because it can once companies need to rely on the likes of new york times to get their stories out of the public those publications including fortune had a virtual monopoly on the information because they controlled the builders aka the newspapers and magazines through the news websites the news that got distributed the internet blew up that monopoly slowly at first and then rapidly at once platforms like twitter medium and substack came to the scene so they're essentially doing what i think you're going to see most companies end up doing creating their own media arm that they can actually use and utilize to whether it's spread propaganda um clarify their position update their customers on new services and updates and products and bloody blah, blah 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 and just essentially provide a kind of like i said a platform where it can provide upbeat and positive news on i guess an industry and a sector they clearly feel like is changing the world because it must be frustrating isn't it right <coughs> i've worked in startups right <coughs> just as an employee and i can just imagine what it must feel like to be an actual founder of a company you're trying to change the world which you know is a bit corny a little bit lame um a little bit trite to say maybe a little bit hyperbolic but a lot of these founders do come into the um scene generally wanting to change the world wanting to be a disruptor wanting to actually revolutionize whatever it is that they're going into and they feel like they're doing good they feel like they're actually providing um the world with a safer way to do a b c d whatever it may be 
and then to have parts of the media platforms like TechCrunch, The Verge, um, you know, Gizmodo, whatever it may be, picking apart every single move you do, scrutinizing every every single decision, painting you in a bad light, not giving you the benefit of the doubt. It must be just exhausting to continually try to correct their, you know, perception of you. So why bother? If you have the means and you have the contacts and you have the uh, the tools at your disposal to change that narrative and provide yourself and the industry at large that you love or people that you feel are like actually moving the needle and changing the world and making it a better place and provide them with a platform that they can actually go to in order to kind of have good press right because there's nothing bad about having good press especially in the world that we live in where you know good news seems to travel a lot faster than good than bad or bad news seems to travel a lot faster than good sorry it's not really it does seem like a really clever idea to do um especially again when you consider that mark and jason has been somebody has been super vocal about his disdain for the mainstream media so much so on twitter he kind of doesn't really play no games the moment you say anything that could be could be kind of um construed as like negative criticism against him you'll immediately block you especially if you're a journalist he doesn't ramp um which is essentially led to the whole taylor lorenz debacle where she tried to get him and his fellow guests cancelled because they said retard in a room where they were describing the wall street bets lingo and how they kind of get down on that subreddit absolutely stupid woman but hey what can you do but i love it man i actually love the idea and I, again I, I can definitely see a lot more companies deciding to um add a media arm to their corporations um again it provides a safe outlet for you to kind of say what you want to say your people are already doing it now on social media platforms as it is again substack medium twitter all these places are blowing up with companies you know most startups i worked for had a medium most startups i think going forward will have a substack um probably most even departments right? i can imagine the promotion pr marketing teams product development having little substack that they can kind of get um their more or kind of uh Ad, ad ardent cheerleaders to kind of subscribe to there's loads of avenues that people can really to explore but i'm definitely keen to see how that develops um, again a160 are big players in the startup industry and startup community in general and when they make a move more likely than not Aaron is going to make a move too um let's read maybe a couple more here it says here let's read this last one and then carry on da, 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 da. Uh, yeah it says here um uh, the 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 other big reason A one sixty has turned its back on traditional media is because a firm like many other in tech world regards a press as ignorant and unfair. Instead of hailing the ways in which tech is changing our lives, these critics say journalists fixate on negative stories, pushing hit pieces and takedowns that serve their own agenda. What's more, A one sixty and others would add reporters are prone to publishing pieces even if they don't know that they're talking about. Exactly, it's better than to leave it to those like the partners at A one sixty to and their scribes who do. So, what should we make of this? I'm surprised. Surprisingly, many reporters are recoiling at what E160 is doing, claiming that its immediate ambitions are simply propaganda, not real journalism. Part of this is sour grapes. Journalists are prone to self-importance and in criticizing the push by E160 and others to cut them off, they may simply be lamenting a loss of power and prestige. And while it's easy to knock E160's motives, um, it's hard to bash the stuff that we that they are publishing. I've been uh, reading the company's fintech newsletters and have conceded they're excellent, sophisticated, well-informed and crisply written if this is the case perhaps our impulse should be to praise rather than criticize the company after all the information they're publishing is free useful and better than a lot of the clip baked drick and passes from much of the real quote-unquote journalism these days and yet as much as to appreciate the high color of content i shudder at the prospect of a world where a 168 um a160 carries more media clout than the times or wall street journal uh, as there is the case with so much more else in silicon valley uh, this new class of media barons appears to have want the money and the glory but not the responsibility that comes with distributing increasingly dominant entire industries. The founders of the E16 year report is sick of growing chorus of anti-tech voices in mainstream media and that's understandable silicon valley despite its flaws still carries still creates so the technology that offers the best hope to elevate global problems such as disease poll pollution and poverty but the tech industry has exasperated a host of other problems from disinformation to inequality and simply adopting a pro-tech vision feels irresponsible so yeah more there you can read again i'll put in a link so you can check it out oh two more paragraphs let's just finish this um this is the, um then there is a truth to, um then there is a truth to power thing a phrase an age of six inside that recently used to suggest to me that the idols of journalism are quaint or naive and i agree in the last century traditional media institutions have been fearless in standing up to powerless uh powerful sorry businesses and presidents fighting in court 
for free speech while individual journalists have gone to jail to protect their sources. Such activities are essential to the functioning of a free democracy and for now it appears A16C is not interested in taking part in them. In this sense A16C's media ambitions remind me of the cryptocurrency industry, a field the firm is also trying to dominate. Many Bitcoin believers will tell you the currency and industry around it are about freedom and escaping the power of the government and the big banks and while there is something to that um, few in the crypto industry have much to say about how they help millions of americans struggling with hunger unemployment and lack of health care i worry that if pressed their response would be it's not my problem again i don't i don't think it's this kind of jeff jeff john roberts of fortune i don't think it's that deep i really do think it's just more so the case of them being fed up of all the anti-tech anti-startup anti-silicon valley um you know uh think pieces and hit pieces that exist out there um they're being sort of lauded as you know the second coming of flipping stalin when they put that products or they say uh, an opinion about the economy or whatever it may be and they just want to provide themselves with a platform and a space that they can freely speak about and kind of uplift the other voices in the industry and again if it turns into more than that then it is but from what i can see it just sounds like a place for them to kind of pat themselves on the back which again isn't a bad thing when you consider that the that i think their benefits definitely far outweigh their negatives but again what do i know what else i want to talk about here move on fortune ba, 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 ba. <clears throat> oh yeah you've seen this so it's courtesy of hype beast so it looks like the wear testers for the tom sacks 2.5s are getting the some more tom sacks mod the nike nike what do you say the tom the the tom Sachs nike craft mars gr 2.5s are coming out and the testers are getting their wear pairs if you remember i think a few weeks ago they did they did this really really cool um wear test thing where um tom Sack studios put together this little challenge where you had to submit um your application in order to be a wear tester which meant you obviously got a pair to test them hint 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 and name you got to jot down your experiences and your kind of insights into how they responded to your everyday task and they would essentially be um uh, relayed back into the final design of the shoe now in my opinion so if i think this is a bit of just an exercise in marketing i don't actually think any of the learnings that are going to be put into the shoe are actually going to be made um implemented into the actual models that see production i think it's just a way for them to kind of see the shoe out and i like it i prefer to see them kind of seeding the shoe out quote unquote to actual fans of the shoe who are actually going to wear them day in day out that makes it a lot better and actually kind of promotes the idea of people actually wearing limited edition shoes that of putting them in clear perspect boxes but if it does end up being a way for them to kind of crowdsource bits of information from thousands of people around the world living totally different lives interacting with the world in all different places during the lockdown is going to be excellent to see how those learnings are kind of fit into the actual final production shoot when we end up getting it so this is courtesy of the hb some pictures here of the shoe people receiving it it looks flipping fantastic i love the fact that they've got this I don't know what, what do you call it? is it TRX Tyrex I've got that material is on the toe box which essentially makes it waterproof because the ones I have at the moment aren't they were the first Mars Yards and they've sort of got a normal mesh uh, um, bit on the toe box here and then I also like that they've reinforced the eyelets with these sort of silver ringlets here which kind of help the laces to stop fraying and also protect the actual eyelets themselves and then of course the sole is brilliant really really great stuff overall in it like they look brilliant you get that in the box you get obviously the shoes you get your little notepad to put all your wear testing details and findings in there maybe a t-shirt you get a little um name tag here that is also may pop in the store and then you also get i think that's a bag you're meant to return your shoes in when you've actually finished wearing them itself but let's continue here it says aside from a pair of upcoming shoes, the size wear testers also receive an ID badge specifically marked with their details image along with a short sleeve Nike Craft t-shirt. Um, an important element of the kit is a pocket sized Nike Craft wear test, Tom Sachs 10 bullets notebook for writing down daily activities. Finally, each kit comes with a rugged dynam dynami, that's a composite fabric shoe bag and stored to carry the shoes around. Okay, awesome. So again, pretty decent, isn't it? To see them. I think there's actually a hashtag here from Instagram I'm going to show you of people actually uploading all their wear test stuff. 
you got somebody here did he actually get a pair or is he just sketching just to act like he's cool yeah this is from december we don't want to give a shit about this is a kid here skateboarding in his pair it looks pretty cool let's play the video i see some niggas attack let's get a sound off because that sound yeah oof nice they look so good in it man i badly want a pair but whether or not that will happen, that is another thing. That's the one that I have, obviously, without the, um, you know, updates on the mesh and shit. I actually quite like that kind of rubberized toe box thing they have. So it kind of, it's a great way to kind of make them, I guess, uh, sort of like a, a sneaker version of a metal toe box, right? On kind of construction boots. I love that. So they make them, you know, workshop ready, um, studio ready. But yeah, they look pretty. They look they they make my that's a problem when you get an update version of a shoe you have they make the one you have either look better or look worse and i'm gotta be honest they make mine look worse <laughs> and then of course they've got another one here with another change in the lacing the, the person flipped the tongue a bit here people got so and again the benefit of this is that there are some people that are probably gonna just you know sell their pairs because you know why not make some money during a lockdown but a lot of the people are actually gonna wear them which is a really really great initiative to promote <clears throat> and it also kind of helps because i think that's the reason why there's not so many of them available for resale they go for a lot of money because everyone actually bought a pair from what i've seen so far seems to actually wear them which again is very very different to a lot of the shoes you see being sold nowadays and especially the ones that are quote unquote hyped so yeah to see people actually wearing them day to day is pretty sick to see man um challenge to build the planet what's this pass okay so skip that one people more people receiving their actual stuff Oh, okay, building a planet itself. Okay, I guess it's one of the challenges included there. Pretty cool, isn't it? All things included, man. It's pretty cool. Someone showing the running they did in the actual shoot itself. Someone just getting it on a hashtag. Why not? Because they want to show off their face. But yeah, see people uploading their challenges. Someone else has got a pair, it looks like. Rugging and snow. They just look brilliant, man. I don't care. They look flipping good, don't they? Let's just be honest. Someone, I guess, practicing some instruments with using them. I'm kind of happy I did. Uh, again, I'm upset I didn't have a pair, but I was, wasn't willing to do like a flipping Nike wear test video, film selfie cameraing myself, you know, you know, speaking highly about shit. Like, uh, it's, not, it's not for me. A bit too cringe. But again, hopefully I'll get them with actually release in the store. Um, again, I'm up to the raffle gods in that regard. Could be lucky, could not be lucky, but fingers crossed, fingers crossed. See, people are actually wearing it. No, how good it is to see this. I, I actually don't mind if I catch an L and people are actually wearing them. It's the fact that, you know, most of the time these flipping shoes get sold from the, you know, they get backdoor to flipping, you know, teenage sneaker resellers who end up selling them for three times their value, sometimes five or ten, to other rich people who end up putting them in boxes or wearing them to flip in one oak. Do you know what I mean? They're not actually good. People are actually going to wear them. That's the annoying part of it. Oh, look at that. Awesome. Using drumsticks to play around the toe box. Let me give that a like. I quite like that. This is all pretty cool. But yeah, man, they've been worn. People are actually wearing them day in, day out. They're actually getting broken in and worn. It's cool to see from people. And again, hopefully they release and we will be able to get a pair ourselves and actually wear them. Um, if that's the case, that would be brilliant. But again, you know, there's holding out hope and there's holding out hope. But hopefully, hopefully this happens. Hopefully that happens. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Pause that one. Let's get off. What else do we want to talk about here? Do, 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 do. Move on from that one. Move on from that one. How, how long have we been talking anyway? Quite a while, right? We've done a bit? Yeah, we've done about 120. I think that might be it. Let's just see if I've got anything else I want to end with here before we leave. Bear with me. Ooh, yeah, this is quite cool. This is courtesy of Hypebeast as well. So look at this. Undefeated Spring Summer 2021. They're saying here that on the title is the first Spring Summer 2021 collection. I'm not sure if this is the... Uh, this can't be the first ever because they do do clothes before. But I've not seen them make anything new in a while. Um, You know, undefeated, you know, um, influential, historic uh, streetwear store. If I'm not mistaken with the kind of lore of the actual name, I'm assuming, if I'm not mistaken, didn't Aaron Bondroff come up with a name and he sold it to um, the owners, right? 
James Bond and whatever his name is James Bond, right? I'm sure it's something like that. He either come up with a name and he swapped it or something happened, something I forgot. But regardless, you know, a historic brand in the scene, you know, a centre of some of the best um, legendary collaborations from back in the day and just generally, you know, a pretty um, good place to go to in order to pick up all your streetwear bits and bobs. And I guess they're kind of pivoting in the same way that Stussy is and they're sort of kind of um, going back to basics and trying to uh, reintroduce their clothing to a very hungry market that you know wants to kind of fixate on a new brand there's a whole new customer base of kids coming up now who are kind of you know hungry for the next brand to kind of latch on to especially with their inability to maybe acquire stuff like supreme and bape and all that good the good stuff some of these other legacy heritage brands who have kind of you know fell out of popular favor can reintroduce themselves again if they kind of um you know uh i guess edit themselves in a way to kind of fit the taste of the current generation i, I look at people at hundreds i think they could probably do the same sort of thing but so far what i've seen this lookbook man this stuff especially this tiger camo stuff that this guy's wearing on the left <sighs> looks fucking delightful tiger camo m65 overshirt whatever it may be the shorts look great um this girl's overshirt she's wearing looks fantastic with the vinyl lettering on the side of the sleeves fisherman's vest here with the, with the beanie hat on great t-shirt with the back print um great styling with the t-shirt over the long sleeve classic streetwear thing that you'd see in maybe a lot of japanese mags with a sweatshirt sweatpants and the air force ones and the durag to match extra long in the back again nice tag or camo hoodie with the air maxes air max 97 collaborations probably due to come out again very soon that tiger camo outfit head to toe is just superb right like that just looks absolutely fantastic i'd wear the f out of that um and again just great pieces overall man look at how good this looks we have a nice little side split here on the side just looks fucking effortlessly cool doesn't it i wonder again if they hired somebody different in their creative direction you know to kind of put these things together oh look at that it's sort of like an overshirt with these amazing front pockets on the front there I'm not sure if those shoes are a collaboration of their pro cares or just like an inline. No, there might be Converse, isn't it? Converse collab there with the shorts. Looks fucking gorgeous. Really, really well done. Again, very simple. Not many, you know, SKUs or items per collection. Couple of bits, couple of tops, couple of long sleeve t-shirts, some shorts, some pants. Those Converses look great. Couple of great bucket hats, of course. You know, these are always going to sell well with the kids. But yeah, I'd wear the hell out of this entirely, innit? It? it looks really, really good. The Nikes are probably not a collaboration. I'm sure they're just normal inline shoes. Classic t-shirts that could easily be worn. But yeah, the combats look really nice. The cargo pants, sorry, combats, we say in the UK. But, but, <coughs> but everything here looks really, really great. Big fan of it all, really. Oh, look at these Air Force Ones. White with the old black sole. I wonder if that's a collab. Oof, that looks nice, innit? Play dirty there at the bottom so so good man again big up um big up undefeated making a big 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 comeback on the scene uh what they say here in terms of dates you can skip all the other stuff there dates first drop um on undefeated website and this japanese site which offers exclusive da -da -da -da. when's it gonna drop sort of date the first drop of the three is oh it's available now okay it's available now so definitely check this out um undefeated's first 20 spring 2021 collection it looks pretty decent man i gotta be honest I gotta be honest, like that look there, those these two looks are out of this world. Really, really well done. Undefeated Spring Summer 2021. Check it out. Check it out. Anyways, that has been the Agostino Zinger Show episode number four three four, I'm gonna say. Thanks much for tuning in as per you. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's the first time check out the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast, I'll please give me a five star review and share the show with your family and friends. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. But until next time, take care, be safe, and peace. <laughs>